tied neck here, as you can see and hear, I still have a problem with my recording equipment. But stick with this video, because in a moment we will see a professor explain Bernard's paradox. This paradox has remained unresolved for over a century. But in the second part of this video, there is an explanation based on a new interpretation of how probabilities form at the most fundamental level. I'm Jonathan Weissman, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. Today I'll tell you about Bertrand's Paradox, what it is and why it's so important. By the way, the name Bertrand's Paradox comes from a 19th century mathematician, Joseph Bertrand. He published a famous example of it in 1889, but his example's a bit tricky. So we'll use an easier one from the philosopher Vaclav Kraka. Here's the example. Imagine a factory that cuts squares of wood. The edges of the squares are always between one foot long and three feet long. Now ask yourself, how likely is it that the edges of the next square they cut will be between one foot long and two feet? Well, one half is the obvious answer. The range of possible lengths for the edges is one to three feet. Imagine a number line from one to three. The one to two range is half of that. So half of the possible lengths are between one and two feet. So far, so good. But now here's the turn. We're going to ask the same question in different words, and we're going to get a different answer. How is that possible? Let's see. Consider this question. How likely is it that the area of the next square will be between one square foot and four square feet? We're switching from talking about the lengths of the square's edges to talking about its area. But this is actually the same question as before. Remember we're talking about squares here, and for a square, having edges between one and two feet long is the same as having an area between one and four square feet. The area is just the square of the length of the edges. 1 squared is 1, and 2 squared is 4. So the 1 to 2 range for length corresponds perfectly to the 1 to 4 range for area. So, what's the probability that the area will be between 1 and 4 square feet? It's 3 eighths, or so I claim. How did I get that answer? Well, the area of these squares is always between 1 foot and 9 feet. The edges are always between 1 foot long and 3 feet long. 1 squared is 1. That's the bottom end of the range. And 3 squared is 9. That's the top end. So let's picture another number line, this time from 1 to 9. What portion of that line is the 1 to 4 range? 3 eighths. So the probability is 3 out of 8, or about 38%. Uh-oh. We got two different answers to the same question. When we did the calculation in terms of the length of the edges, we got 1 half. When we did it in terms of the area, we got 3 eighths. So which answer is right? At this point, you might be thinking we've screwed up the arithmetic somewhere in there. But the arithmetic is fine. Go back and check as many times as you want. You won't find any errors in the calculation. So what's going on here? Well, it's a well-known mathematical fact that the size of a range of possibilities depends on how you describe it. In terms of the length of the edges, the 1 to 2 range is half the total range from 1 to 3. But in terms of area, it's smaller. When we switch to area, we square all the numbers. And squaring larger numbers increases them more than squaring smaller numbers does. So the range from 1 to 2 grows, but the range from 2 to 3 grows by even more. So the first range of possibilities looks smaller from the perspective of area, even though it looks the same size from the perspective of length. So Bertrand's paradox isn't the result of any calculation error. It's the result of using the size of a range to determine its probability. Put another way, the paradox arises from a famous principle known as the principle of indifference. In its simplest form, the principle of indifference just counts possibilities. Imagine you're at a racetrack and three horses are running, A, B, and C. What's the probability that horse A will win? Well, one out of three, obviously. Let's assume ties are impossible just to keep things simple. In general, the principle of indifference says, when the number of possibilities is n, each possibility has probability 1 out of n. For the flip of a coin, there are two outcomes, heads and tails, and each has probability 1 half, 1 out of 2. If there's a dartboard with four sectors, 
you test probability 1 out of 4 of being where the dart lands, and so on. Notice, by the way, that the principle of indifference only applies when all you know is what the possible outcomes are. If you have more information than that, for example, if you know that horse A is sick, that changes things. Then the sick horse is less likely to win than the other two. The principle of indifference doesn't apply there. It just tells you what probabilities to start with before you get any relevant information. Okay, so how about when there's a continuum of possible outcomes? In our square factory example, the length of a square's edges could be anywhere between 1 and 3 feet, and you can't count all the points in that range. Well then, the principle of indifference says to use the size of each range to determine its probability. If a range of possibilities takes up half of the total range, then it has probability 1 half. If it takes up a third of the total range, then it has probability 1 third, and so on. And that's how we end up with a paradox. Because we saw that the size of a range of possibilities depends on how you describe it. Using length, we get one answer, one half, in the square factory example. Using area, we get a different answer, three eighths in that example. You might be surprised to learn that Bertrand's paradox turns out to be a big problem for scientific reasons, because the principle of indifference is supposed to answer a crucial question. It tells us where to start when we're working with probabilities, and probabilities lie at the heart of pretty much every branch of science. Whether it's medicine, psychology, or physics, every field of science relies on statistical reasoning. And the same goes for our daily decisions, from dietary choices to political policies, in fact, those decisions often rely on the findings of scientific research. So the principle of indifference is supposed to determine the starting point for all scientific inquiry. But we've seen that it leads to contradictory results. In fact, this problem has had a huge impact on the development of modern science. For over a century, statisticians have struggled to find methods that work around it. But they still disagree and argue about how to deal with it. And as a result, they even disagree about what to make of the results of various scientific studies. So Bertrand's paradox goes right to the heart of debates about science and its objectivity. Part 2 of this video explains an objective understanding of quantum mechanics with an emergency based on a geometrical process of spherical symmetry forming and breaking. Within such a process, the future is not totally random and is relative to the geometrical choice of how we choose to measure or calculate the probability. Bertrand's paradox is solved by a deeper understanding of the universe as a geometrical continuum of continuous energy exchange, continuous creation. If we start at the smallest scale with the Planck constant, we find it is very often linked to 2 pi. This happens so often in quantum mechanics that a new mathematical symbol was created called h-bar to represent the Planck constant divided by 2 pi. In this video, instead of making new mathematical symbols, we are going to explain a geometrical process that the maths is based upon. In maths, 2 pi can represent three things. Number one, it can represent a complete rotation on the complex plane. Number two, it can represent cylindrical symmetry that has line symmetry. And number three, it can represent a two-dimensional aspect of spherical symmetry. I will explain these three different aspects of 2 pi within one universal process, with the Planck constant being a constant of action in the dynamic geometrical process that we see and feel as the passage of time. In this diagram we have the complex plane with zero in the center representing t equals zero. We can think of this as one photon electron coupling or dipole moment equals zero, the moment of now, with the positive numbers representing an infinite future and the negative numbers 
representing an infinite past. There is symmetry between the positive and negative numbers, representing the symmetry between the future and the past, as the future unfolds with each photon-electron coupling or dipole moment. This forms CPT symmetry, with symmetry between charge, parity and time. We have symmetry between matter and antimatter, and because the absorption and emission of light or photon energy is spontaneous, there will always be the continuous annihilation of antimatter. In this theory, the antimatter annihilation represents the past at the smallest scale of a process of continuous energy exchange with the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics representing the same uncertainty we would have with any future event. In the equation for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle we find not just energy and time but also we find 2 pi representing cylindrical symmetry. Each rotation of the complex plane forms a new Raymond surface as the future unfolds photon by photon. This process will form cylindrical symmetry that we can see in this image of a sine wave forming a vector with line symmetry as the process unfolds. But this is formed by spherical symmetry with light waves being formed by the wave particle function or probability function in the form of an inverse sphere. In mathematics a sphere is represented by 4 pi and if the equation for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is reformulated using position and momentum we have 4 pi. The interior of a sphere is naturally three-dimensional giving us the three dimensions of our everyday life. As a process of continuous spherical symmetry forming and breaking this also gives us a geometrical reason for positive and negative charge with a concaved inner surface for negative charge and a convex outer surface for positive charge. Therefore we can have the use of the holographic principle with the information of our three-dimensional universe encoded on a two-dimensional boundary condition by the movement of positive and negative charge. This whole theory can be explained in just one equation with energy equals mass linked to the Lorentz contraction of space and time. The Lorentz contraction represents the time dilation of Einstein's theory of relativity we have energy slowing up the rate that time flows as a universal process of energy exchange or what I like to call continuous creation. Mass will increase relative to this process with gravity being a secondary force to the electromagnetic force. The C2 represents the speed of light radiating out in a sphere of electromagnetic radiation from its radius forming a square of probability. We have to square the probability of the wave function because the area of the sphere is equal to the square of the radius of the sphere multiplied by 4 pi. This simple geometrical process forms the probability and uncertainty of everyday life and at the smallest scale of the process is represented mathematically by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In such a theory we have an emergent future unfolding photon by photon with the movement of charge and flow of electromagnetic fields. The brackets in the equation represent a dynamic boundary condition of an individual reference frame with an arrow of time or timeline for each frame of reference. The infinity symbol represents an infinite number of dynamic interactive reference frames that are continuously coming in and out of existence. As a universal process of energy exchange, each individual is in the center of their own 
reference frame with a probabilistic, uncertain future unfolding relative to their actions. In such a theory, creation is in the hand and eye of the beholder. Thanks for watching. Please share and sub. It will help the promotion of this theory.